Welcome to AJP Audio for the month of February 2022. I'm Aaron Van Dorn. Today on the podcast, I spoke with Dr. Margaret Sibley, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington, about a new article in the American Journal of Psychiatry looking at the rates of remission for children diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Dr. Sibley and co-authors looked at longitudinal data that followed children diagnosed with ADHD for up to 16 years to track variable patterns of remission in ADHD symptoms. Afterwards, we'll once again speak with Dr. Ned Kalin, Editor-in-Chief of AJP, about what else you'll find in the February issue of the journal and what it brings together. Dr. Sibley, your study looked at the variable patterns of recovery and remission in children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder into early adulthood. What did you find? So I think to describe what we found, the first thing I want to talk about is what we did. We did a study where we were really interested in understanding whether people could recover from ADHD long-term, which means they no longer have symptoms and they're doing really well and it lasts permanently for the rest of our study. One of the things that we already know from the research is that some people who have ADHD as children still meet criteria for the disorder as adults and some don't. But when somebody doesn't have ADHD anymore, not all of those people are necessarily created equal. So some of them may have just like one symptom short of the ADHD diagnosis on the checklist. Other people may have no symptoms at all. And so trying to understand a little bit about whether there are people that really overcome all of their symptoms and are doing a lot better as life goes on for them across the years. So in our study, the first thing that we did is try to define what we would call full remission from ADHD, which means somebody who really doesn't have any evidence of ADHD anymore. And we found that the best way to define this was by having three symptoms or less of ADHD. And then we took a look at that definition, combined it with, you know, requiring that people not be having any difficulty or impairments in daily life functioning in their life. And also we wanted to make sure that they weren't receiving treatment that could be explaining why they didn't have ADHD anymore. Using that definition, we were able to identify that at any given time point in our study, which had eight different time points in it, about one to 18% of the children with ADHD as they grew older, no longer had ADHD. They were fully remitted. But If you looked at the full sample, about 30% of the sample met the criteria for full remission at any given time point in the study. What's more is that about two thirds of those folks who did remit from their ADHD had the ADHD reoccur at a later time point. So overall, we found that the most likely thing to happen when somebody does demonstrate overcoming their ADHD is that it does tend to come back. And in fact, if you look over time across the study from when the um, children were eight to when the children were about 25 years old, the most common thing that we found was a fluctuating pattern of meeting criteria for ADHD in some years and not meeting it in others. And when people didn't meet criteria for ADHD, Most of the time, they were what we would call partially remitted, which means they still had mild symptoms and impairments because of the ADHD. It was pretty rare for them to not have any symptoms at all. Previous estimates suggested that around 50% of cases saw ADHD remission by adulthood. In fact, your study found that while many cases might not meet the DSM classification for ADHD, the impact of ADHD symptoms still presented impairments for these patients. Can you tell us a bit about the DSM definition of ADHD and the impacts of ADHD symptoms on patients? Yeah, it's really important to understand that ADHD is sort of on a continuum. It's not like you either have ADHD symptoms or you have no ADHD symptoms. It's on a normal curve. So Somewhere we draw a line and decide, well, this person has enough ADHD severity that they should get the diagnosis. And then there's a lot of other people who may have very mild symptoms, or even the average person we found in our research will have one or two symptoms of ADHD. When we think about the DSM criteria and the history of making the DSM criteria, first they had to decide like how many symptoms are enough that we would consider the person to have a mental disorder which means that they have to have serious dysfunction in their life. Right now, if you are under 17, you have to have at least six symptoms of ADHD. And if you are over 17, you have to have at least five symptoms of ADHD. On top of that, 
you have to have impairment in daily life functioning because of the symptoms. So if you're a kind of hyperactive person or you have trouble paying attention, but you have other strengths or you're in a environment that means that those tendencies don't get you into any trouble, we would not say that you meet criteria for ADHD according to the DSM. In addition, you have to show the symptoms in more than one setting. So for a 12-year-old who has a really tough science teacher and is really seeming to struggle in that class, but seems to be doing well everywhere else in their life, we wouldn't give that person an ADHD diagnosis because it's limited to one setting. And then finally, we have to make sure that the symptoms of ADHD are chronic. So they're kind of life course type of symptoms, not something that just pops up, you know, at a certain time period because some of a stressor or because of difficulty coping with a new situation. And we have to make sure that it's not something else causing the symptoms. So for example, other um, mental health disorders like anxiety or depression can also cause concentration or motivation difficulties. Sometimes when people are heavily using substances, they get cognitive symptoms like memory difficulties that also you know, can show up as a positive endorsement on an ADHD checklist. You can think of other examples too, physical illnesses, trauma, side effects of medication, all kinds of things cause difficulties in cognitive control. But ADHD is given when it's sort of like a lifelong biological presentation that a person struggles with these behaviors. Data used followed patients for 16 years from childhood to early adulthood around the age of 25. What were the advantages and limitations of using this kind of longitudinal data? The biggest advantage of the MTA study, which is our data set, is that it was a study designed to look at ADHD over time. And so all of the participants in the study were given detailed questionnaires about their ADHD symptoms that were answered by parents, by teachers, by the self over time, every single time they came in, which was every two years for about 16 years. So that's the advantage is that we can look at a group of people over time and see how they change because we keep asking them the same questions and we ask the same, them the same way, you know, at all those different time points. There's a lot of other longitudinal studies out there that were not designed to measure ADHD. And so they don't always have the very careful records that can help us with all of the pieces of the puzzle, the impairment, the symptoms, the other disorders that could mimic ADHD that we have to count out, the treatment history, you know, knowing what, when they're on medication, when they're receiving therapy, and how that may impact whether someone should be considered to have ADHD or not. The downside to a study like this is that it only includes people who are identified as having ADHD in childhood. And there are other people who, although they probably had ADHD when they were a child or else they shouldn't have been given a diagnosis, they are sometimes not identified or noticed until they're older. And so some of those people might include people with milder forms of ADHD, people who are minorities and culturally ADHD may not be recognized as something to seek help, mental health help or medical help for in their families. Women with ADHD are often diagnosed at older ages than men with ADHD. So, you know, where we may be excluding some people. On the other hand, something really beneficial is if you just recruit a sample of adults with ADHD, you're actually often missing the most severe individuals because what we've learned from studying people with ADHD over time is most people with the most severe forms of ADHD, they don't seek help. They don't talk about their symptoms, and they often don't even report their symptoms when directly asked. Uh, they don't always see them as a problem. They may see them as just part of their personality. And so it's really important that we use these longitudinal samples where we can follow people over time, even when they're no longer seeking help or considering themselves to have ADHD. Your study found that most, 90% of adolescents with ADHD, had intermittent relief from symptoms over time, with far fewer patients having consistent symptoms or total remission. Moving forward, what does this mean for treatment of patients with ADHD? Well, I think one of the most important messages there for providers is if you're medicating a patient for ADHD or you're, um, you know, you've done behavior therapy with them or cognitive behavior therapy with them and you feel like it's time to terminate, just because they're doing better now doesn't mean that the ADHD is cured and that it, they don't need treatment again at another point in time. 
So we want to monitor patients after, you know, you've discontinued treatment to be on the lookout for possible worsening of symptoms. In our study, we detected them on average four years later. So several years later, you know, still having those annual check-ins or a couple times a year. And I think we have more research to do on what determines a good period of time versus a more challenging period of time in someone's life. But, you know, if we are able as clinicians to identify the determinants of positive functioning for people with ADHD, we can start building recommendations and interventions around those positive things. And I think we want to be looking a lot at environmental fit. I think we'll be looking a lot at things like lifestyle choices and making sure people are in supportive situations, because ultimately it makes sense that these are probably the types of things that may help somebody be doing better long-term. What do these findings suggest for further research into ADHD diagnosis and treatment? Well, I think we do need to do a little bit more work on understanding exactly what leads to more positive periods of somebody's life. I also think we need to repeat these analyses in other kinds of samples to really understand if we need to be thinking about ADHD as more of a dynamic disorder that isn't stable over time, that waxes and wanes. Should we be thinking about ADHD as something that is biologically represents a vulnerability or a risk towards a certain syndrome or disorder, but ultimately that there is some control there about whether that risk translates into something that fully meets the criteria for a mental disorder. An analogy that I think is really helpful is, you know, turning the volume up or down on the ADHD tendencies that a person has and what we can do intervention wise that can help us do that as well. But I think there's a message of hope here for patients with ADHD. And I think that providers should communicate that to patients. You know, there is some aspect of ADHD that can be managed and that even if it's a kind of lifelong journey for people to learn how to manage it, we see in most of the subjects of the MTA study that there were times where it was under control. And I think that glass half full mentality is, you know, a healthy one to communicate to patients instead of the opposite, which is, you know, it's pretty rare for people to, to fully kind of grow out of their ADHD long-term. What does treatment for ADHD look like? And what do your findings reflect about that treatment? How would this affect treatment going forward? So there's two evidence-based treatments for ADHD. One is medication, which is often stimulant medication, but they're also effective non-stimulant medications. And those medications are commonly things that everyone's heard of like Adderall or Ritalin which is a form of methylphenidate. The other is a behavior therapy, which as people get older into adolescence and adulthood, there's a cognitive behavior therapy element of that as well. And it's basically helping people identify ways that they can shift their environment in order for them to be most successful. It involves also teaching people strategies to manage their ADHD and adaptive ways of thinking to help them overcome some of the cognitive difficulties associated with ADHD and a lot of things like teaching time management skills, helping people organize their life and a good, you know, psychologist or behavior therapist can implement those types of treatments. A big piece of this that I think, you know, we have to think about is how to motivate people to engage in the treatment. So we know what's effective. Um, but it's really hard to get folks to consistently utilize the treatments and come in and, and get help. And so I think one of the big questions that faces our field now is how do we connect with people who may be um, moving into a more challenging period of their life and make sure they're getting the help that they need? Treatment access is, and treatment engagement is, is kind of our biggest challenge right now as a field. I think that we see that transitions to different parts of somebody's life are often sort of key points in time where, where people struggle because getting used to a new environment, like just transitioning to college, transitioning to a new job, transitioning to being married, those types of things are often points in time where people struggle. And we really want to start, I think, thinking about how do we build interventions around helping people kind of navigate those new parts of life. But overall, I mean, both the medication treatments and the behavior therapies are effective. And I think combined treatment is often shown in the research to be the most effective, most powerful way of treating ADHD. 
And so I think a lot of work has to be done in just kind of helping people reach those opportunities in their communities to get to get help. Dr. Sibley, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Up next, Dr. Ned Kalin. Once again, we're joined by Dr. Ned Kalin, Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry. Dr. Kalin, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Earlier in this episode, I spoke with Dr. Margaret Sibley about ADHD. What else is in the February issue of the journal? So this is a uh, really interesting issue. It's focused on developing the modifications of or actually developing new treatment modalities. And what I find particularly interesting and exciting about this issue is that it not only is is it opening up new insights into these areas, but it really spans our treatment modalities in psychiatry all the way from psychotherapeutic interventions through new psychopharmacological interventions, through modifications of neuromodulation strategies that have the promise of being more efficient and more effective treatments for our patients. Also in this issue, we have a very important clinical case conference that is focused on structural racism and systemic racism as it relates to patient care at the individual patient level and really nicely illustrates the importance of taking into account issues related to systemic racism as we think about trauma and trauma-informed therapy as well as as we think about not only interventions at the individual level, but interventions at a societal level for these issues. Some of the specific papers in this issue that are highly relevant, one is is one that you already mentioned related to the long-term outcomes in individuals that have ADHD symptoms. And this is particularly interesting because it's a longitudinal study following a relatively large cohort of children that were diagnosed around 16 years of age and following them up to uh, around when they were 25 years of age with really detailed assessments. So this provides a in-depth understanding of the outcomes uh, from childhood to early adulthood of individuals that have ADHD. And the findings are important because they show that there are different trajectories of outcomes in relation to remission in relation to persistence, in relation to recovery. And the bottom line is is that there are fluctuations in these symptoms, and it appears that many people continue to have symptoms throughout this period with some fluctuations, as I mentioned. Very few people, a relatively small percent, end up fully recovering, but most have uh, fluctuating courses. This could be helpful not only in relation to thinking about different subgroups of ADHD patients in different trajectories, but also is a reminder to us about the need to be uh, following and uh, continuously assessing ADH symptoms as, as individuals develop from childhood into adolescence into adults. One of the things that's really also interesting in, in this issue is a bit of an emphasis on psychotherapy. Dr. Markowitz provides a really nice commentary on the importance of psychotherapeutic interventions for treatment-resistant depression, and uh, in addition to emphasizing the need to perform a trial of evidence-based psychotherapy in treatment-resistant patients, also suggesting the possibility that this be incorporated into the definition of treatment-resistant depression, that is a failure of a trial of an evidence-based psychotherapeutic approach, reminding us of the importance of psychotherapy not only in treatment-resistant depression, but also in relation to other specific disorders for which we have the evidence base. Along those lines, there's an original research paper that has assessed and surveyed psychiatrists from the standpoint of whether or not they perform psychotherapy in their practices. And I suppose not surprisingly that if you look at the trends over the years, what you find is is that there continues to be a decrease in the number of psychiatrists that provide psychotherapy. So for example, from 1996 to 2002, it was estimated that 27% of psychiatrists provided no psychotherapy in their practice. When the the researchers looked at the 2010 to 2016 data, this uh, number actually increased to over 50% of psychiatrists reported that they did no psychotherapy in their practice. Now, what's interesting is that this is in the face of what appears to be patients acquiring psychotherapy at a regular, uh, sort of the, the amount of that is stable suggesting that the amount of psychotherapy 
that is being provided by psychiatrists is going down, but totally patients are still receiving psychotherapy from other types of providers, including psychologists. Dr. John Rush writes a really nice editorial related to this paper that gets into not only the findings from this paper and what they might mean, but also highlights the relevance of these uh, decreasing trends in the, uh, to how they relate to the practice of psychiatry, patient care, and residency training. Now we have also two papers related to psychopharmacology and new developments there. One is a double-blind clinical trial, phase two study, looking at a drug called esmethadone, uh, which is also known as dextromethadone as an adjunct of treatment for major depressive disorder. And in this particular study, uh, led by Fava and colleagues, this drug was added to ongoing regimens of antidepressants in patients that had failed to respond to the medicines that they were on. Now, the reason this drug is interesting is because it is a drug that is thought to work by partial NMDA antagonism, and it also has weak mu opiate effects. Now, this is important because, as you know, methadone is used as a treatment for uh, opiate use disorders, and in part that's related to its effects at the mu opiate receptor. So this is a drug that's got some NMDA effect, but very low mu opiate receptor effects, and was conceptualized to be potentially important based on uh, some of the work that was done with ketamine. In this particular study, placebo was compared to 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams of this drug, and um, uh, the drug was given for seven days, and patients were only followed for 14 days. So it's a short-term study. It's important to keep that in mind. But nonetheless, at 14 days, when remission rates were looked at, the placebo group had a remission rate of 5% as compared to remission rates of 31 and 39% in the two esmethadone uh, treatment groups. So this is a really interesting finding. It's an interesting drug. Uh, it's very early. Uh, the sample size uh, is relatively small, and the patients were followed for a short period of time. Dr. Charlie Nemiroff writes a nice editorial uh, putting these findings in context, also in the context of new antidepressants that are emerging. He also talks about the possible mechanisms of action uh, of this drug. Now, similar to that and building, you know, related to the NMD antagonism story, we have a paper also that combines ketamine infusions with a mindfulness-based intervention in trying to maintain abstinence and reduce drinking in individuals with alcohol use disorder. And in this particular study, the investigators led by Morgan et al. had four different conditions, basically. And the conditions were getting three ketamine infusions with mindfulness-based prevention, relapse prevention therapy, getting three ketamine infusions with a sort of a control for the mindfulness-based prevention therapy, which was alcohol education, three saline infusions with mindfulness therapy, and three saline infusions with education. And the idea here was to, in patients that were, were abstinent, to look to see whether or not the addition of ketamine would further enhance the psychotherapeutic approach. What the investigators found was, in fact, ketamine did appear to have an effect. It was not a large effect, but it, at six months follow-up, patients that received ketamine, regardless of whether they got therapy, had a 10% reduction in the number of days that they were abstinent during this period. Interestingly enough, this did not interact with the mindfulness-based psychotherapy. So the combination of mindfulness-based psychotherapy with ketamine was not superior to ketamine with the educational sessions. And also, the investigators found that while the number of days abstinent was significantly improved, when individuals really looked at relapse, they found that this did not affect uh, relapse from the standpoint of more significant drinking. The authors suggest that the combination of ketamine and mindfulness-based psychotherapy may be an optimal treatment approach, but in my reading of this paper and the data, I don't think that they're there yet. I think that it's a small study, and the evidence does not support this at this point. It does support the idea that ketamine could be a, a helpful adjunct in maintaining abstinence in individuals with alcohol use disorder. And then finally, when we think about neuromodulation, 
we have now in our armamentarium a variety of opportunities ranging all the way from ECT to transcranial magnetic stimulation. And there has been a tremendous amount of work looking at ways to improve upon the efficiency and efficacy of conventional repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which, as you know, has been approved for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression. In a paper in this issue in the journal, authored by Nolan Williams and a group at Stanford, the authors report on work that they've been doing that builds on a previous paper that was actually published in AJP that looks at the modifications of transcranial magnetic stimulation using a method called intermittent theta burst stimulation with an accelerated protocol. And I won't get into the details of this now. You can, uh, uh, those that are interested can read about it in the paper, but suffice it to say that the idea here is that theta burst stimulation is a way of mimicking the natural rhythms that occur in uh, different brain structures, particularly the hippocampus, that are thought to be related to neuroplasticity, memory, and learning. And what these investigators did was use intermittent theta burst stimulation and gave that uh, in an accelerated way such that they did it over a five-day period, repetitively doing this with numerous periods of stimulation throughout the course of a day. So that they basically condensed down the timing for the amount of stimulation given from four weeks or five weeks to five days. They also performed neuroimaging uh, in these individuals and used a method to more precisely locate the site of stimulation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so what the, in this particular study, what the investigators did was that they first identified the group of patients that were treatment refractory in a double blind fashion. They assigned them to two groups. One was a sham group, but the other was the intermittent TBS group. Patients got neuroimaging scans. Functional connectivity was used to establish the area of the brain that was most inversely coupled to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in a region called area 25. It gets a little complicated, but this is a region that has a lot to do with emotion regulation and also has been implicated as being uh, having altered function in depression and also is a target for deep brain stimulation. So they identify the precise site in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that was most inversely coupled to function in area 25 and use that then as the target. And by so doing in this particular study, what the investigators found that after five days of this protocol, uh, when they examined you know, where people were, they found a very strong effect four weeks later, such that at this follow-up point, the group that had the active treatment had a remission rate of 46% uh, and a response rate of roughly 69%. This was compared to the sham group that had a remission rate that was zero at that time point and a response rate of around 7%. So this is a remarkable difference. I think that this could be a very important advance therapeutically because not only does it show relatively longer term efficacy after five treatments, but it also demonstrates the capacity to condense the treatments down in a way that can accelerate the response in the treatment. And also importantly, these investigators demonstrated that this was safe and that the only sort of significant increase in side effects was related to headaches, which you do see with TMS. So this is an exciting issue to conclude, and maybe just to, again, to sort of go over some of the important points. One is uh, the importance of considering evidence-based psychotherapeutic interventions in defining and treating treatment-resistant depression. Another really critical point that, that we emphasize here and have made a priority for the journal to be focused on is the necessity of understanding the effects of structural racism and formulating and understanding patients in their treatment. New evidence that this NMD antagonist as methadone, uh, which has very weak mu agonist effects, may have rapid antidepressant effects when added to ongoing antidepressant therapy. And then finally, the, the possibility that high-dose theta burst stimulation combined with functional imaging targeting may result in more efficient and effective responses in patients with treatment-resistant depression. 
And uh, I should also mention, the, as we've already talked about, the ADHD findings demonstrating the importance of following patients longitudinally and expecting fluctuating courses, and also the possibility that ketamine could be useful in the future in thinking about reducing drinking behavior in individuals with uh, alcohol use disorder. Dr. Kalin, thank you once again for walking us through the February issue of AJP. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Take care. You too. That's all for this month's episode of AJP Audio, but APA Publishing has other podcasts you can listen to. From Patients to Practice looks at the latest research published in the journal Psychiatric Services, hosted by Dr. Lisa Dixon, Editor-in-Chief of the journal, along with Dr. Josh Bearson. Psychiatry Unbound is the books podcast from APA Publishing, hosted by Dr. Laura Roberts, Editor-in-Chief of APA Books. Check out these and others along with APA's newest podcast, Mentally Healthy Nation, at psychiatryonline.org podcasts, or you can subscribe via Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts.